Hello, hello. We're about to learn about autonomous cars and some other interesting things. John Rousseau is the executive director of Artifact, a digital innovation firm in Seattle. His work is at the interface of augmented reality, automotive, and entertainment. Before Artifact, he also was executive, crea executive creative director at Frog, you know, no big deal. Um, he's going to talk about passengerhood on the road to autonomy. Please welcome John Rousseau. Thank you. Good afternoon. How are you guys hanging in there? It's only me that stands between you and happy hour, so you're almost there. Um, well, I'm, I'm super happy to be here this afternoon to talk to you a little bit about the complexities involved in designing for uh, autonomous cars. Um, but to start, I thought it would be interesting just to understand how many of you all drive on a regular basis. So can we do the hand raise thing? Like how many people drive on a regular basis? Okay, maybe 80%. How many of you would give up your car for an autonomous car if you had the choice? Yeah? Early adopter crowd, clearly. Um, <coughs> well this afternoon, my, my talk is really about this transition. Um, it's, it sounds really great. The, the promise of autonomous vehicles is fantastic, right? They're going to eliminate traffic, um, relieve me from the burden of driving, allow me to do all kinds of stuff whilst I'm in the car that I can't really do, at least legally today, um, and make, make lives better, right, uh, along many, many different vectors. And yet, the path to that is incredibly complex, not necessarily just in terms of technology, which is true, or in terms of systems, which is also true, uh, but in terms of people, in terms of kind of all of us really messy, unpredictable human beings who actually kind of operate these things and have to interact with and engage them. Um, so today I'm going to talk about how we manage that transition, um, how we think about the distance between where we're at today um, and where we want to be. Because I have a hunch that when you all raised your hands and said, like, give me the autonomous car, the thing you have in mind is probably 20 years away, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more. Um, but there's, there's a pretty big distance to cover between now and then. So how do we get there in terms of UX? How do we get there in terms of uh, designing for these systems in a fundamentally human-centered way? That's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to spend the first half of my talk uh, developing a little bit of context around this issue, both in terms of why it's hard in terms of human-centered design, um, why it's really compelling and dramatic in terms of business, and then I'm going to get into a couple of projects that we did at Artifact in order to address these, these issues. So first, to get to the future, we have to go to the past. Um, the vision for self-driving cars has been around for decades. Uh, this particular image is from 1957. It was an advertorial, if you know what that is. It's essentially an advertisement masquerading as content for a power company that was advocating the idea of electric autonomous vehicles that would do everything that I just said they would do, right? Relieve traffic, make your life better, um, while at the same time, conveniently using a lot of power, right? Which would be good for the electric company. And I bring up this example because it, it illustrates a couple of important things. First, our vision of the future is inextricably linked to our position in the present. And what I mean by that is that anything I tell you today about what's going to happen in the future, you should take with a huge grain of salt because I have no idea. Um, none of us do because the best we can do is to think about the future through our own unique lens at this moment in time, which is all the artist who drew this car was doing when he made this kind of glass bubble roof and this 1950s family and the dominoes and the paper plane and the whole shtick, right? It's actually kind of funny to look back on it, and we, we look back on it as kind of nostalgia at this point. Um, we're no better off today. Secondly, um, what always happens when we envision the future is that we, we underestimate the complexity of the challenges that we face. So in this particular image, 
you may notice that the family is essentially in their living room on wheels, right? They're gathered around this table. And the car at the same time has a conventional steering wheel. It has a conventional dashboard. And it feels almost like two separate cars that were sort of slammed together in order to illustrate this point. Two separate cars that would not really be uh, suitable for the purpose at hand. In other words, not really good at being an autonomous car, not really being good at a car that I need to drive in terms of how I actually would engage the system. So if dad needs to turn around and take the wheel for some reason, how does he do it? What, what actually happens in that sequence of events in terms of the affordances that he uses, in terms of the interface, in terms of quite simply his seat? Um, how does that happen? Right, and that, that's just one example. Meanwhile, the rest of the domino playing family has no access to the controls. They have no way to kind of touch the radio. It's too far away, right? The car is, is poorly designed by, uh, by any standard. <coughs> and what's, what's funny, I suppose, is that that hasn't changed much. So if we look at this image, which is from the Mercedes concept vehicle of last year that was introduced at CES, the Mercedes F15 um, autonomous vehicle concept. Um, the, the vision of the future has more or less stayed the same, right? I'm sort of turned around, my back's to the wheel. It's not really clear how this car has been optimized to essentially afford the duality of its operation, right? Like it, it's a car that still has a steering wheel, albeit one that's shaped a little bit like a jelly bean, and it's unclear how I would actually use that to drive it effectively. Um, it's unclear how these seats, which seem to be really optimized for lounging, would actually convert into something that I could use to kind of drive purposefully. And it's, it's quite unclear how all of this works in terms of interface. Uh, Don Norman has written a length about systems like this, and this is really kind of the, the nature of the challenge we face today, which is to say that as we make this transition, and as we kind of wade through this, this murky water between cars that we have today with steering wheels and cars that we ha may have tomorrow without steering wheels, as we drive cars that we have to monitor and perhaps control some of the time, maybe even as we drive cars that we want to drive sometimes because we simply want to drive, we're going to have to figure out a bunch of uh, complex things about the interface that allow us to kind of make that happen, not only to make it happen in a safe way, but to make it happen in a delightful and positive way. So, so where might we look for guidance? Some obvious, obvious places, right? We could certainly look at airplanes. Um, airplanes have had autonomous pilots for quite some time. You most likely flew here today unless you're from Helsinki. Um, and you most likely flew on a plane that for the most part, uh, for the duration of your flight, was on autopilot. And the, the role of the pilot was simply to monitor the systems of the aircraft, ensure that everything was operating well, and to take over during critical applications. Right? That's, that's the job. And so, it's interesting to look at airplanes through this lens and think, well, what, what might we think about um, relative to cars? Um, interestingly, in 2013, the FAA, um, which is the US Federal Aviation Administration, did a big study on automation. And they, they came forth with some perhaps not surprising, but fairly bold conclusions. One of them was that pilots, the more that they relied on these autopilot systems, were becoming worse and worse pilots. They were not capable of taking control of the plane in critical conditions. They tended to make a lot of mistakes when they did that. And even perhaps more worrisome, they began to rely on the technology so much that they stopped trusting their own instincts as experts and they started relying overly so on the system. And so in issuing this report, they, they essentially said, um, operators, name for airlines, we encourage you to encourage your pilots to fly on manual more so that you don't kind of lose your skills. We need you to fly on manual more so that you don't kind of lose the tangible, tactile feel of piloting the aircraft because maintaining that fundamental human skill, the human skill that involves kind of 
physically interfacing with this machine, um, you can't lose that. You can't lose that touch or that ability. And so it's really interesting then to look at contemporary airplanes and see how the cockpit looks, right? So this, this first image, which was the background of the last slide, is an Airbus A350, right? The newest, latest and greatest plane from Airbus. All planes today are fly-by-wire, which simply means that the controller is electronically connected to the plane systems. It's not physically connected like it used to be. And so that allows you to do some interesting things with the interface. It allows you to do something like, for example, put a joystick where that big yoke-like thing used to be. Now, the interesting thing, though, is that we're starting to kind of change the paradigm of how I operate this machine. And we could think about cars in the same way. The more we alter, say, the steering wheel, the more that we alter the mental model of what it means to drive, um, the more we have to really think about these affordances and give them careful consideration such that we design them in a way that they actually work. Now, I would contrast that plane to this one. Anybody know what, what this plane is? Or from what era it is? Old or new? So we got one new, I heard a couple olds. Um, it, it, this is actually a Boeing 787 Dreamliner, so it's the, the most modern and latest plane from Boeing. And what I find fascinating about this contrast is how the design philosophy is radically different between these two machines. The Airbus plane has an interface that feels, at least to me, a little bit like it was designed for people who play video games, um, down to the controller as joystick. Whereas the Boeing plane feels like it was designed to remind you that you are in a serious situation and you better not mess it up. Um, interestingly, the Boeing plane has the, retains their traditional yoke. And so in line with this same advice to operators that the FAA released, um, Boeing also built in uh, haptic feedback to that controller. So there's actually the physical sensation of, of flying the plane. So when you're, if you're a Boeing pilot, you kind of maintain this, this real tangible physical connection to the aircraft that an, Air, an Airbus pilot does not. And I'm not saying that one's better than the other, but I think it's quite fascinating how radically different these two global leaders address the same design problem. So if we think about UX for autonomous cars, there are a number of near-term things that we need to solve. So if we think about this transition, I'm going to have a steering wheel. I'm going to, you know, like all of you, be familiar with driving as it exists today. And over time, <coughs> I'm going to need to understand and learn how to use this new thing. And I'm going to need to adapt to this new paradigm. So there are some specific UX challenges that arise. Number one, uh, is just the increasing systemic complexity. As I was preparing for this talk, I was kind of waxing nostalgic about my own first car, which was a 1984 Chevrolet Camaro Z28. And I was so cool at 16. And thinking about that car and how simple it was compared to my current car, which is co comparably kind of a mess in terms of the UI, right? That my old car had just a few simple controls. It was very clear what each control did. They were mostly single purpose. And not only that, in that era of driving, I could get into any car and essentially intuitively understand how to operate it. And that's, that's no longer the case. Today we live in a world of really bloated, feature-filled cars that are incredibly hard to learn and to understand. J.D. Power did a study in 2015, measuring the extent to which people have the capacity to understand their um, new cars, uh, and specifically new technology features within those cars. What they found was that over half of the respondents never used over half of the new features in their car, which meant that they were driving around um, not really understanding what, what it was that they bought, what its capabilities were, what they might do with it. Right? And that, that, that's a problem that just gets worse. The fancier the car, 
the more features that it has, the more buttons that it has, the more redundancy it has in terms of the way that its interface is typically arranged. So just dealing with that complexity is one level of problem. It doesn't even have to do with autonomy. But imagine layering on different types of autonomous features on top of that condition. Second um, are new and varied mental models. So if you think about things like in some cars I can access the interface by gesture and some I have this sort of circular rotator controller in the center and others I have different affordances, right? You've probably all had the experience of getting into a rental car or someone else's car and not knowing how to do some fundamental thing like turn on the lights or the windshield washers or heaven forbid use the infotainment or navigation system, right? So the mental models of all of these systems are wildly inconsistent. And again, autonomous functionality is gonna have to be layered on top of all of that stuff. Third, most people don't trust this technology. So I, I was joking at the outset about my audience of early adopters and how almost all of you are willing to give up your car today for an autonomous vehicle. You are an anomaly within the market. Um, there was a study that came out just this week um, that showed uh, essentially four out of five people that were surveyed um, said, I don't trust it, I don't understand it, um, that's just not for me, right? So for the vast majority of people that are not part of this, this class of technology early adopters, the idea of kind of letting go of the steering wheel and letting the car drive itself isn't appealing, right? It's not appealing because the capability isn't understood and because uh, that's just not how people think about driving today. So that's something we as UX designers need to, need to overcome. Specifically, we need to help people understand the capabilities of these systems. One of the reasons that everyone in the JD Power study is not using the features of their cars is that they're opaque, right? The cars do an incredibly horrible job of revealing what they can do and how to operate it. And so as a result, uh, who has the time to sort of sit in the car and actually figure all that stuff out? Uh, nobody, right? So part of the job for UX design in the next decade or so is to reveal this in a much more fundamentally natural way. Uh, operating a car is gonna have to be as simple as operating a smartphone, as operating any other piece of consumer technology. It's gonna need to reveal itself and it's gonna need to be something that I am capable of teaching myself. And once you've done all of that, um, you need to get into the really hard problem, which is the handoff problem. So if you buy into the idea that it's not gonna be a light switch moment where all of a sudden we have autonomous cars and everybody's just you know, being driven around by some service right, that we subscribe to, most likely what's going to happen is that these features are going to emerge over time and we're gonna have to deal with, with the complexity of this handoff problem, which is simply, I have to give control to the car under certain circumstances and let it drive. And then there are times when the car is either gonna have to tell me to take control back or I may want to take it back for some reason. And I need to figure out how to navigate that ambiguity. And that, that's not a, a lighthearted ambiguity, right? It's a really serious one because it goes to the sort of foundational safety and reliability of the system. So how we, how we design these types of experiences and flows incredibly important and incredibly hard. Combine that with the new mental models problem and you could imagine that everyone who's introducing a semi-autonomous car in the next five to 10 years is most likely gonna have a slightly different way of doing this. That's not good. And then on top of all that, layer on the fact that much like airline pilots, you are all gonna get to be worse drivers than you already are. And I know you're bad drivers because I drive on the same roads with you and I'm constantly frustrated by your behavior. Um, it's not good, right? So ev every day, like I, I've been working on autonomous cars now for about a year and a day doesn't go by during my commute where I pine for that, for that day, right? Where whoever's in front of me doing something incredibly obnoxious could just, you know, be driven by software instead of by their own obnoxious habits. Um, that's just the tip of the iceberg though. So if you think about the messiness and unpredictability of human behavior relative to this design problem, um, that makes it really hard too, because we have to design systems that 
are capable of adapting to a wide range of contexts, beliefs, behaviors, systems. It's, it's a really hard problem, right? And you combine that with a high degree of human agency, and you've got yourself a really wicked near-term design problem that not enough people are paying attention to, right? Amidst the romance of what autonomous cars propose, not too many people are thinking about the complexity of these really simple problems, right? The fact that I need to figure out how to give the wheel to the car and I need to figure out how to give it back. So, so that's, the, that, that's the landscape in terms of the automation problem. I want to layer on top of that kind of the business problem uh, because we can't really separate the two things, right? We have kind of a set of UX issues that are incredibly important and we, are, uh, we also have a number of business issues that are creating realities in the marketplace that we're going to have to design for or against depending on what we believe. Um, anybody know what this is? Not a video cassette. I'll give you one more guess. First digital camera, excellent. Um, this is the first digital camera. Do you know who invented it, guy in back? Kodak, excellent. Um, so this, this is the first digital camera. It was invented in 1975 by Kodak, um, which I hope the irony is not lost on you, right? That, that Kodak, 25 years ago, more than 25 years ago, my math's bad, 40 years ago, um, invented the digital camera in an era when film was the predominant medium. And the reason that that's interesting to me in the context of automotive is that Kodak faced a business decision. The decision was simply, do we continue to invest in this technology? Like that's a really cute project you just came up with over there, Jim, but we're making billions of dollars selling film. I just don't see it. And that was the decision they made. They, they deprioritized this project, um, did not continue to pursue it, and as a result, missed the disruption that was digital photography, which they invented, and went out of business, went bankrupt, and have now been reborn under different guises, but as a shadow of their former selves. The automotive industry faces a similar choice, like almost the same choice. If you think about the timeline that's proposed for autonomous vehicles, it exists, say, 25 to 30 years in the future. So put yourself in 1975, you've got your first digital camera. That's where we're at today in terms of autonomous vehicles, and the automakers face a similar choice. They know that Google's busy working on its Koala car, and at the same time, they have to protect their multi-trillion dollar global industry that is based on building individual cars that people drive as drivers, right? So there's, there's this huge existing infrastructure and this huge existing business that they have to willfully disrupt. And that's, that's gonna be a pretty tricky game to play, right? To both disrupt your own business model whilst not cannibalizing the one that you have. And that, that then becomes a design problem, as you could imagine, because those automakers are gonna have to make decisions about the nature of the products that they make, and those decisions are gonna be based on what they can actually accomplish, right? If they can continue to sell cars with steering wheels, I bet you they're gonna continue to wanna make cars with steering wheels because they can sell a lot more of those, right, for obvious reasons. So the landscape, the business landscape is fascinating. I've seen a couple pictures of this car today. Um, this is obviously the Google car. There are two factions that are battling for sort of first place in the race to autonomy. On the one side, we have Google. Google has humbly referred to their endeavor as the moonshot. Uh, Google's goal is to develop a completely autonomous self-driving car that does not have a steering wheel. Google has been very straightforward in suggesting that um, humans are actually the problem. Like humans are the flaw in this system and by eliminating the flaw in the system, we will create a better product. And they're, they're probably right about that, right? I, I actually don't disagree with that sentiment. Um, at the same time though, just like with 
the power company and the electric autonomous car, we have to be wary of and informed of Google's motives, right? So Google, Google wants to make a car, sure, and they want to help the planet, maybe. Um, but, but mostly, they want to hold you captive in like a mobile data mine, right, that's rolling down the highway, giving you more opportunities to use their products and services. And so we have to be mindful of the politics that inform Google's choices, even as they have fairly noble motives with respect to UX. Their goal, and one and why it's a moonshot, is that they want to get one of these on the road within the next four years. Probably possible in a limited market in a controlled environment. So you've got that going on. That's putting enormous pressure on the automakers to kind of catch up. And of course, Google's not a car company, so if your car doesn't have a steering wheel, doesn't need the same sort of safety um, equipment that a, a contemporary car has, that operates on software instead of human agency, you can build that in a fundamentally different way than what the OEMs are capable of doing. So that's putting enormous pressure on the OEMs to develop a response to that. And their response is, is quite different. So for the OEMs, <coughs> I'm calling them the pragmatists, most of them have come up and said, well, we're gonna release this step by step because listen, we know how to make cars, you have to trust us that we know how to make safe cars and we're not gonna sell you anything until it's ready. Also a noble strategy. Uh, the politics there are, of course, they would rather sell you a car with a steering wheel. And so that's gonna be the drama that plays out over the next 10 to 20 years as these two different platforms compete and sort it out. Meanwhile, amidst all the drama, um, there's just some baseline reality. So an SAV in my lexicon is just an abbreviation of semi-autonomous vehicle. The reality of, of SAVs is that I think they're actually going to be the dominant paradigm for the foreseeable future. There are a couple reasons for that. There was a McKinsey study that said by 2030, 15% of cars on the road will be autonomous, fully autonomous. And that sounds great, right? Like that sounds optimistic and super interesting. Um, what that doesn't say though is, is the obvious flip side of that, which is that well, 85% of cars are going to be conventional. And so between now and 2030, the mix of cars on the road, let's say in 2030, the mix of new cars that are sold divide between 15% autonomous, 85% semi-autonomous, plus all of the cars today that are on the road that are neither of those things. So that, that, that's an incredibly long time and an incredibly messy system if you think about all of these different types of vehicles with different types of capabilities sharing the road at the same time. And that's part of the, the design problem that we have to help solve too. So at Artifact, we, we wanted to understand this uh, a little bit better in terms of what that meant for UX. And so we developed a simple framework to explain that. And this is it. We divided, we divided this period of time into three critical phases. Um, these phases represent UX priorities. So y'all are UX designers. These should be the things that you're thinking of relative to these moments in time. So from our point of view, the first thing that we need to think about is how we establish trust in this technology. You heard me say that the vast majority of people today who haven't experienced the technology um, kind of don't want to, right? So initial formative experiences with the technology are incredibly important. Hence, the first five to 10 years have to be spent designing things that build trust in the technology. Now that's overlapped by the complexity of phase two, which is agency. So that's actually balancing um, the degree of control that the user has um, against the degree of trust that they have in the system. And we think that the interesting point is actually where that intersects around 2020. So around 2020, you're going to see, uh, I think really interesting products on the market, cars that have really advanced semi-autonomous capabilities and also cars that um, require a lot of interaction and monitoring on the part of the driver. Those are gonna be the hardest design problems within this entire space. Finally, we get to being a passenger. And I think that arguably the Google car by comparison 
is a far simpler proposition. Because if you don't have to deal with all of that complexity and you're essentially designing a mobile media environment, um, that's not necessarily an easy problem, but it's not nearly as hard as the semi-autonomous problem. So we did some work with Hyundai to explore these issues and to sort of think through that near-term intersection. So that intersection where the trust curve intersects with the agency curve. So for a 2020 vehicle, um, how might we think about designing for that? Um, what we created were a set of opportunity areas and then some design provocations that illustrate how we think about it. These are kind of fancy wireframes, so they're not full systemic thought through designs. Um, they are illustrative of the ideas that we think are important. So the opportunity spaces, which I'll, I'll go through in order. First, an engaging co-pilot. Um, we heard about robots this morning, and when we were listening to that talk, the thing I kept thinking of was, again, relative to my talk, was this is all about relationship. This is about establishing human relationships with artificial intelligence. And an autonomous vehicle is artificial intelligence on wheels. So the first opportunity is, well, how do we do that? How do we make the co-pilot this engaging presence? We have to build trust, and we build trust through transparency. So how do we make sure that the car is capable of reflecting what it can do? We need to really rethink the interface itself. Um, because of all that complexity that I mentioned, um, how do you add, say, 2x or 3x the amount of information that a semi-autonomous car needs on top of the existing automotive HMI? It's complicated, right? So adaptive interfaces where we actually reveal things relative to context and use help us solve that problem. And then finally, we need some new affordances. So we need some both physical and digital affordances that will allow us to kind of navigate this transition. So the engaging co-pilot is all about optimizing that relationship, right, between the car and the driver. So I'll tell you briefly what's happening in this video, and then I'll go quickly through the bullet points that explain it. So this is a work scenario. I'm on my way to work. It's my daily commute. The car understands that there's an accident up ahead and is essentially acting on my behalf and saying, I'm going to reroute you. Tell me if you disagree with me. Right, so that, that's what's happening. So there are some specific points um, that, that reflect the, d the design principles that we need to kind of think about in relation to this opportunity space. First, our implicit cues. So how do we implicitly convey that the car knows who I am, knows what I want to do, knows what my preferences are, and kind of is going to make the right decision on behalf of me. Second, what are the explicit things that I need to show? So I explicitly need to show things like the current state that I'm in, the path that I'm on. Um, and because we have a limited bandwidth to consume this information, we have to be very choosy right, about what we show when and where. The car needs to proactively suggest how my trip could be better. And then finally, it needs to communicate any changes in plans. So this isn't just putting some features in the car and letting the driver kind of figure out how to pilot this thing. It's actually uh, being very thoughtful about how you begin to establish a relationship, right, that, that evolves over time, that gets better over time, uh, but that is very much a dialogue-based relationship between the driver and the car. The second thing we explored was the idea of transparency. So this is simply to say that the car needs to convey what it sees and what it intends to do about it. So in this scenario, the car is in autonomous mode. It sees that there's an SUV that's going to pull out and potentially T-bone me. It shows me that it understands that before I've even seen it. It conveys what it's going to do about it by saying, well, I'm going to either stop or swerve. And then once it's confirmed that that vehicle has stopped, it kind of goes back to normal. So when the car is in autonomous mode, particularly in this, this transition period, it's going to require like extremely explicit cues about what the car is capable of right, and what it's doing in that moment. 
couple other things. So visualization of immediate surroundings, specifically dynamic objects, their level of risk. We barely scratch the surface in terms of the complexity of this problem. Imagine trying to accomplish this in New York where you have you know, hundreds of people at each intersection. It needs the ability to kind of make decisions on its own to adapt the route based on changing conditions. The ability to forecast where it cannot operate autonomously, which is incredibly important, right? Because initial cars are not going to be fully capable. And so the car is actually going to have to know what it can and can't do because I'm probably not going to be able to keep track of all of that. So there will be moments where the car has to say, you know what, you need to take over. You need to do what you need to do. And then finally, it needs to ask for feedback when things kind of don't go as expected. So in building this dialogue with the car in the spirit of transparency, we want the car to essentially be a learning environment where the car is constantly getting better as a result of asking for feedback. And if it does something wrong, it gives me an opportunity to correct it. Third opportunity area, adaptive interfaces. This is perhaps the most self-explanatory. I'm changing lanes on the highway. I'm going on an overpass to go on I-5 North, Los Angeles. And I've decided that I actually want to drive for a while, um, as I just do. And so the driver changes the car from autonomous mode to manual mode by simply taking the wheel and then taking the curve. And you see that the interface changes dynamically and instantly in that moment, pivoting from one mode to the other. Uh, it'd be very difficult to put all of this stuff on one screen at one time. And again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So we need to think about, particularly in an era where we have screen-based interactions, we have the ability to free ourselves from manual gauges and dials and meters and the like. Um, we have the ability to create much more sophisticated mechanisms of progressive disclosure in order to optimize the interface for the context at hand. So in this example, we optimize the interface depending on whether it was in autonomous mode or manual mode. The interface needs fundamentally different affordances for each of those activities. Very purposeful display hierarchy. So the heads-up display does, di does a different job when it's in autonomous mode versus when it's in driving mode. In driving mode, the goal of that display is to keep me focused on the road. And so that's where it wants me to look. And it kind of directs my gaze there by putting essential information in that spot. Transition needs to be automatic and seamless. The thing that makes cars harder than airplanes in a way is that cars have to be immediate. Cars, there's, there's very little room for error because things happen in a matter of seconds or less. In an airplane, things happen over much longer periods of time. And there is typically a much larger uh, margin of error in terms of the pilot's ability to respond to an emerging situation. Not so with a car. And that brings me to the final opportunity, which is new affordances. So that's our fancy UX way of saying that, well, we need to create new ways of facilitating this, this interaction, new ways of facilitating this interaction of giving control to the car and then taking it back. So to do this, we literally redesigned the steering wheel. Um, which was a really interesting experience. Uh, we, we purposefully combined both physical and digital affordances to both create this sense that I'm literally like giving control to the car and then literally taking it back, as well as digital cues that allow me to understand exactly what's going on in that moment, right? And to provide confirmation that yes, it's done and it's happened. We also changed the way that the steering wheel functions we took a little bit of liberty in terms of assuming um, that we could take that center column and make it function two ways. That it could function in a fixed conventional way when I'm in manual mode, but that when it's in autonomous mode, it actually stays in the middle and doesn't move. And the reason for that is that we wanted to maintain its integrity as a display surface. We use it as an interface point. It's going to be really hard to touch it, for instance, if it's moving around. If you've ever been in an autonomous car, or even a car that self-parks itself, for instance, and you've experienced what it's like when that wheel starts turning on its own kind of surprisingly violently, 
Um, we wanted to minimize the visual distraction of that because again, I'm sort of sitting there watching this happen. So by maintaining a fixed center column, we're able to at least both communicate what the car is doing, right, which is part of what that physical affordance of the wheel turning does, while at the same time minimizing the distraction, kind of jarring nature of that interaction. So that was all well and good. And we thought, like, that was, that was a really interesting exploration to look at these really kind of hard, immediate, pragmatic problems. Um, and we love digging into that stuff. But then we decided to spend a little time thinking about the other end of the curve. So specifically, well, what, what does happen under that big blue empty area kind of at the end of this journey? And the prevailing notion is that, well, we're all going to be in Google Pods or the equivalent, right? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think that that's necessarily the way that it's going to work out because, again, you can't predict the future from my point in the present. So we thought as a provocation, what if we started with the assumption that technology is going to augment rather than replace human drivers? So a bit of a thought experiment. but. If you think about it for a moment, and you think, well, if technology is so sophisticated that I can get into a vehicle, turn my back to the windshield, and let it drive me someplace without having to monitor it or engage with it, then logic holds that other things might be possible, like a new form of driving might emerge. You might be able to allow me to have some degree of engagement in this experience while also keeping me safe. Uh, or you might be able to at least give me the choice to do a little bit of both. And as you could imagine, that scenario becomes incredibly appealing for the car companies, right? Because it allows them to continue with their prevailing business model. So, so we started to play with that. We developed a, a conceptual car interior that started to play with the notions. So assuming that we were not really limited by the kinds of very real constraints we were working on when we were working on a, a 2020 Hyundai Genesis. Um, this, was, this was a blank slate. And the first provocation is simply, well, what, what if the whole environment becomes the interface? I, as we experience advances in, you know, both different types of sensing, gesture recognition, voice, alongside of AI, machine learning, and so on, we can actually start to do some kind of amazing and magical things within the cockpit of the car. Um, so the whole car then becomes the interface. The seats are part of the interface. I can put contextual displays anywhere that I want them. I can, I can essentially create the car as a malleable canvas that adapts to a wide variety of driving modes. Today, when we think about semi-autonomous cars, they're typically presented as binary. So if, you, if you're familiar with the, the most recent Volvo car, for instance, what happens is that in autonomous mode, this huge screen comes out of the glove box because it assumes that you want to watch Netflix. And the steering wheel sort of recedes, and vice versa when you start to drive again. And we thought, well, that can't be the only experience, right? There, there has to be something about driving. And so if we gave people the option to have the best of both worlds, what might that be like? So the seats in our car are malleable, as I said. We were really interested in the idea that we don't want to make these sort of big lounge captain's chair like, like in the Mercedes example that I showed, but how can we make a seat that could fulfill a range of purposes? So if we think about the seat as this malleable surface that has the ability to expand and contract, has the ability to be more or less soft, has the ability to um, sense different things, has the ability to deliver haptic feedback, I can then enable a range of really interesting experiences that feel, on the one hand, a lot like performance driving, and on the other hand, a lot like luxury commuting. And maybe I can do, maybe I can do both. So on the engaged driving end of the spectrum, the car starts to actually respond to what the driver does, what the driver wants to do. We think that one of the fundamental flaws in the way that we think about not only car technology, but technology period, is that we tend to think about the fact that we have to change our behavior relative to the technology. So if we think about a future car that's 20 years away, what if the car actually adapts to me? So what if the car 
actually kind of changes its behavior in accordance with what I want to do, in accordance with what I actually do, right? So if I grab the wheel kind of aggressively in the 10 and two position, um, the car kind of responds in a certain way, right? The steering wheel changes shape. Um, you know, my seat gets a little bit firm. I start to have physical dials and affordances for doing common tasks instead of touch screens. Um, so I'm optimizing the driving experience. We think that the biggest missed opportunity in the land of the Google pod is actually that, that, that driving is still fun and it's fun under certain circumstances. If we could give people the opportunity to do that while also keeping them safe and giving them the flexibility to just ride home from work when they want to, um, that would be great. And so that's what happens in, in this stage, which is that you know, in the mindful comfort mode, the car essentially you know, relaxes. Like the car is, is essentially a mirror of what you want it to be. And so in relax mode, the seats kind of open up, they fall back, and the car becomes much more of an ambient data environment. We were pretty deliberate about being kind of minimalist in the interface because again, we, we wanted to challenge the notion that the only possible option was a giant screen emerging from the glove box. You know, who knows what kind of screens you'll have in 2020. Perhaps you'll just have a hologram that floats by in front of you and that will be enough. I hope that it's not a big screen. So what's next? Um, clearly we're not there yet, right? I think that this is going to be a pretty long journey. And while it's an incredibly s exciting one, it is no doubt an incredibly long one. So I'll, I'll leave you with, with one prediction about the future, um, which is that I think the future is actually gonna be wildly diverse. I don't think that we're going to see the same kind of software driven, eat the world disruption in automotive that we have seen in other categories. I think the space is too hard. I think that the business is too big. And I think that the opportunity is too great to find other ideas. I think the design plays a central role in that process. And so I'm incredibly excited to see where that goes, where you and we as designers take it. Thank you. Thank you, John. As, um, if you have questions, please raise your hands and the microphones will find you. So, am I getting this right? The steering wheel will basically, in 20 years, be as antiquated as a floppy disk is now? I think it's gonna be a different steering wheel. Right. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the car, I, I think it's interesting to think of the car 20 years from now as being connected to the car as we know it, but being fundamentally different. And that was, that was what we really wanted to explore and not just assume, that our design task is to make a rolling media mm. environment, which I think right. is actually kind of boring. Right, so let's not just slap some ads on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Probably a good no idea. No Starbucks coupons <laughs> in these scenarios. <laughs> I see a hand down here and down Hello. here. Hello. Oh. Uh, yeah, I had a, c had a question. Um, Could you please, li uh, please get up and tell yeah. us your name? Sorry. Thank you. Hi, I'm Roger. Uh, really nice talk, thank you. Um, I was thinking, how do you account for boredom? Like when I have a three hour ride and something might happen and I might be somewhat sleepy or well yeah. doing other stuff basically because most of the time my car will be driving. Yeah. How are you designing for that? I think uh, that's one of those hard problems about this, this transition and it, it's not just a three hour boredom problem. There, is, there are thick piles of research on the history of automation that suggests that the more tasks become automated and the more that we as humans essentially become monitors of our technology, our capacity for sustained and focused attention becomes 15 minutes. So it, it doesn't take three hours to become distracted and bored. It takes about 15 minutes to be essentially incapable of doing the job that you have to do, which is what makes this incredibly hard. So for near-term semi-autonomous vehicles, it's gonna be really important to design that, that experience. And I haven't seen a good answer for it so far. If you watch the Tesla videos online, so Tesla a few months back introduced via a software update some autonomous self-driving functionality into his cars. And of course, what happens? Messy, unpredictable humans go out and make YouTube videos of themselves trying it out that weekend. And so it, it's a fascinating thing to watch because people essentially are driving like this. They're like, I, 
it works, it works, and they're, they're like prepared, right, to sort of clench the wheel at any point. And there's one moment where this guy is like taking it off an off-ramp and he's kind of super excited that it's actually working. Um, but there's a point where the car can't see the edge of the road, which is how it's kind of using lane keep. And it starts to swerve into an embankment and he has to like quickly grab the wheel and take it back. That's a bad experience, right? It's a bad experience that's not been thoughtfully designed. And so as we get to that point where we're giving over control, whether it's for something like highway driving or it's limited in-city autonomy, we're gonna need to really think through how we, how we handle alerts and notifications, how we, you know, like what, 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 what happens to the driver? Like, am I really just supposed to sit there and like watch the wheel and is that a good experience? Um, so I think that we always have to put this through the lens of, you know, what, what's just gonna be a fundamentally good experience, a fundamentally good human experience. And maybe it's sitting there watching the thing drive while I read the paper, uh, but maybe it's something else that we haven't thought of yet. Over, over here. Um, so I was wondering about if you spend any time looking at um, alternative ownership models, because this seems like one of the most interesting things about autonomous cars to me. Why would I have a car in my garage if I could just let Uber use it while I'm not using it? Or sure. why not have a car for you know, your three elementary school children that just like picks them up and takes them to school and like I never use it? Yeah. Uh, cars in general now seem to be geared around you know, old, rich, white people. Um, and what's that model look like when it's for you know, different segments or something like that? Uh, did you guys look at that at all? Yeah, I mean, that, that wasn't really part of the brief that we wanted to explore. I, mean, that's, I think that that's a separate and equally fascinating design problem, which is to say there's a whole realm of service design problems that need to be sort of thought through, and then the associated products that are gonna be a part of that scheme. Uh, both Ford and GM have invested heavily in sort of experimenting there. So GM uh, invested in Lyft a month ago. Ford is experimenting with car sharing programs as is Chevrolet in places like Manhattan where they're not really cannibalizing the market that they already have, say in the suburbs. So I, I think that you're absolutely gonna see the emergence of new ownership models that are enabled by this technology, right? And how great would it be to have an autonomous car do your bidding um, while you're busy, right? I would love it if I had that service to pick up my kids so that I don't have to. That would be great. That's a ways out. Hello, Jenny. Um, I'm curious if you know much about um, investments that are being made about um, researching what's gonna happen outside of the car in terms of signage, traffic laws, maybe actually changing the, the roads and how, how they work. So um, any insight into that? See, I told you guys that I can't predict the future and what do you do? ask me a bunch of questions about the future. Um, you're absolutely right. So I, I conveniently ignored the entire kind of regulatory and infrastructure issues that are associated with this systemic problem. Um, had I had more than 45 minutes, I could have talked a little bit about that. Because um, that, that's the third leg of the stool, which is to say that these products are gonna have to exist within kind of very comp complicated human context, but also complicated environmental context where we have a road system that is designed for a different type of product. We have behaviors that are associated with different types of products and all of these things are gonna have to coexist. So those kind of fantasies you have about platoon autonomous cars getting you to work in a third of the time or something like that are gonna be really hard to pull off without kind of major infrastructure upgrades, right? Both in terms of figuring out how these different types of vehicles actually share the road together, um, but also figuring out what sort of connected infrastructure is required to make them work well. So those types of things, it's not just the vehicle to infrastructure issue, like does my car kind of know where it is in the world? Is it communicating with the environment around me? It's also, is it aware of the other cars and can they talk to one another? You know, what happens when one of the cars in the group can't talk to the other ones? How do you ensure a common platform? Those are really big hurdles to overcome before we get to, to that, particularly at a point in time when nobody's incented to work together. So it's a bit of a space race right now and everybody's doing their own thing in line with their own interests. And it's gonna take probably some breakthroughs 
prior to everybody agreeing um, that they need to get along and adopt a common platform. Great. I think on that note, thank you so much, John. Thank you. We just got a last minute announcement to make, so, um, so we're going to cut the last question. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>